speaker is uh, Pravesh Kotari from Carnegie Mellon. And he will give a talk about strongly refuting all semi-random Boolean CSPs. Yeah, go ahead, Pravesh. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let me know if you have like trouble hearing me or something. Uh, so thanks, uh, Andre and Yakub, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I guess I'm super excited to tell you about this very recent work uh, done jointly with my student, Jackson Abasco uh, and Venkat Guruswamy. I think he is on the call uh, here. Um, you know, before I begin, I want to apologize. You know, I tried making, uh, you know, actual slides on actual PowerPoint, but, uh, you know, um, I was way far from finishing and I thought, well, you know, they're all mathematicians, you know, we can take the math. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm just gonna do it in the style that I, I'm teaching these days. So uh, hopefully it will be fine. Hopefully my handwriting will be readable, but you know, of course I'll be slow. Uh, and so feel free to stop me. Good, so, uh, you know, I don't expect you to understand any of the words in the title right now, except maybe CSPs. And so I will explain everything, uh, you know, uh, about what the result means and, uh, you know, uh, I actually, probably won't get to the details of how our result works because I think my main uh, focus is to uh, uh, impart uh, some of the understanding of the tools that we have in this area. And so, you know, if I only get through that, I would consider it a successful talk. Uh, and, you know, towards the end, if I have time, I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, uh, some of the new ideas that we have in this work. Good. So let's begin. So let me start straight away by, you know, um, defining what the central object of you know our 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 uh, uh, our goal itself is uh, you know in the stock is to design you know certain kinds of algorithms for uh, certain problems related to CSPs called as refutation algorithms. Okay, and there is like a gory detailed description. I'll I'll go through it very slowly right now. But you know, at a high level, you should think of it as like some natural average case problem related to you know max CSPs that you know we are all familiar with. Okay. So more specifically, here is what's happening, okay? So it's an algorithmic problem. The input to the algorithm is gonna be a CSP instance, okay? Now I'm gonna always assume that the number of variables in the instance is N and the number of constraints is M, okay? And think of M as some function growing with N and would actually always be at least N as I'll soon tell you. Um, the constraints are generated by applying a certain predicate I'm going to think of the predicate as some arbitrary k bit Boolean function. So it's a arity k predicate. And it takes only Boolean assignments. For this talk, my Boolean assignments would be, you know, values in plus or minus one. So those are my bits for today. And, you know, I'm just going to label satisfied as one. I'll say the constraint is satisfied. That means that the predicate takes a value one. The constraint is unsatisfied. That means that the predicate takes a value zero at an assignment. Okay. So hopefully, you know, the description of the instance uh, at a high level is clear. It has n variables, m constraints, and is described by a predicate p. Now, more specifically, when I want to choose an instance, I have to give you two sets of things. Okay. What do I have to give you? Well, I have to give you the k tuples on which this predicate is applied. So, you know, I will have m different k tuples. I will think of this as simply a hypergraph, a K uniform hypergraph on N vertices, okay? So this hypergraph H describes the K tuples, the ordered K tuples that appear as constraints, okay? In your CSP instance, good. And, but that's not enough because, you know, on every K tuple, I will have a certain literal pattern applied before applying the predicate P. The literal pattern or the negation pattern would be described by another k bit string. This time I have a k bit string for every edge, every hyper edge of the graph H. Okay. And because I'm working on this, you know, Boolean setting, like, you know, where bits are plus or minus one, I can actually think of bi1, bi2, bik, each of these as, you know, simply um, uh, plus minus one bits themselves. Okay. And here's how, you know, the constraint works in this setting. If you have a k-tuple, let's say the ith k-tuple is xi1, xi2, xik, then to generate the constraint, I first, you know, shift the bits by multiplying them by the corresponding bi value. So xi1 gets multiplied by bi1, xik multiplied by bik, and so on. Then I apply the predicate, and my constraint says that, you know, I should find an x such that, you know, this ith constraint is satisfied, meaning p when evaluated at, you know, the shift of X by B should take the value one. 
Now, you know, if you're more familiar with the zero one version of the thing, you know, this is simply like multiplying bi one simply corresponds to negating xi one when bi one is like minus one. Okay, because when bi one is minus one, it basically flips xi one from plus one to minus one or minus one to plus one. So this is, you know, this is simply the plus minus way to describe plus minus one world uh, description of, you know, the usual negation, et cetera, that you might be very familiar with. Good. So good. So now, you know, we have a, a description of the instance in some gory detail. Uh, for such an instance, uh, I would describe val i, this will be a notation for value of the instance i. It just means the maximum fraction of constraints that any assignment can satisfy in this instance, okay? So in particular, I'll think of i of x as the function that calculates the fraction of constraints satisfied by a given assignment x. So, you know, I treat, of, I treat i, the script i as a function on plus one minus one to the n to, you know, um, uh, uh, the interval zero one. Okay, and it calculates uh, what fraction of constraints are satisfied by x. And so val i is the maximum possible fraction of constraints satisfied by any assignment x. Again, feel free to stop me, okay? This is, uh, I, I'm gonna just like uh, 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 be super slow and super, uh, 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 try to be super clear. Good. So, okay, given such an instance with all this, you know, description to play with, what is our goal? So our input, you know, remember was this input, you know, CSP instance. Our goal is to output some value V that is in the interval zero one, okay? And I would say the algorithm is correct if for every possible input instance i to the algorithm, the output value v always satisfies v bigger than or equal to val i, meaning I always return a value which is larger than or equal to the true value of the instance, okay? I never return a value which is smaller than val i, okay? Notice that so far, if this is all my goal, then you can trivially solve this problem <laughs> by simply, you know, not even looking at the instance and outputting one all the time, okay? So of course the problem isn't interesting so far. In fact, you know, I talked about uh, average case and all that. There is nothing average case about the problem so far, right? Like this guarantee and this goal has to hold for every instance i. The average case component comes in in the usefulness part of the guarantee. So in addition to these, you know, correctness guarantee, I also want a usefulness guarantee and that usefulness guarantee is gonna be an average case guarantee. In particular, this guarantee says that when the instance is chosen according to some distribution D, and I'm, I'm gonna describe some natural distributions on CSP instances very soon to you. If I pick an instance at random, then you should output a value V, which is strictly less than one, 99% of the times. Okay, in other words, for 99% of the instances chosen according to the distribution D, the algorithm should output a value which is strictly less than one, okay? What does strictly less than one mean? So remember, V always has to be an upper bound on val i. If V is strictly less than one, it means in particular that the algorithm is claiming that the instance is unsatisfiable, okay? And because of the correctness guarantee, because the algorithm never underestimates the value, the transcript of the algorithm gives me a certificate that the input instance was unsatisfiable. Okay, so this is basically a formalization of the problem of generating a certificate of unsatisfiability for a random instance drawn according to the distribution D. Okay, any questions so far in the setup? Good, again, feel free to stop me anytime, okay? So let's clarify what distributions, right? What distributions are going to be of interest to me? Well, I'm actually gonna talk about two uh, different kinds of distributions on CSP instances. Um, the main result is really about this semi-random CSP instances, but you know, in order to uh, generate intuition and tell you about you know, what problems it relates to, I also wanna talk about a different random model of you know, just the usual plain random CSP. Now, I feel like you know, if you've ever seen the word random CSP at all, this is the model you've seen. Okay, so let me describe what that means. Remember our instance, to choose our instance, we had to choose the set of k-tuples that appear in it, and we described that by using a hypergraph h, and we had to describe the negation patterns that appear on each possible edge. In the random CSP model, both these choices are made uniformly at random. Okay, so choose the hypergraph to be an 
uniformly random hyper k uniform hypergraph with m hyper edges and choose every negation pattern to be a uniform k bit string independently for every edge that's the random csp model okay so that gives me one instance of the refutation problem that i just defined for you where i plug in this particular distribution for the usefulness guarantee okay the second kind of and slightly more general distribution that i will care about today is when the graph h is completely arbitrary so there is no distribution on h that i want to choose i want to make this algorithm work for every possible choice of the hypergraph h but the negation patterns continue to be uniformly at random and independently chosen for every hyper edge okay those are the two models i will care about and so i'm going to call the second model semi random model the first model the fully random model okay and, and i guess the point uh, is that the semi random model has much less randomness in it in its description than you know the random csp model in particular because the k tuples are completely fixed in the semi random model good so when when i describe the problem to you some of you might have felt some awkwardness why should i be able to satisfy the correctness guarantee and this guarantee at the same time like in particular if v is less than 1 and v always you know is lower bounded by val i such a goal is feasible only if the true value the value of the instance i when i is chosen according to distribution d is you know strictly smaller than 1 because if val i is 1 in other words if the instances are satisfiable then this is never going to be possible there is no such algorithm that can ever meet my requirements here so let's you know make sure that this goal is actually feasible for both the models that we talked about again i'm not going to give you the details of this very very simple argument but you know just by some churn of bound and union bound argument you can prove that as long as m is bigger than n over epsilon square up to some constant that depend on the arity of the csp actually you can take it to be 2 to the o of k so you know think of k as a constant then you know this is some n over epsilon square uh uh, uh constraints as long as you have at least that many constraints regardless of whether the graph was chosen the hypergraph was chosen uniformly at random or a fixed completely arbitrary graph as long as the negation patterns are chosen uniformly at random and independently for every hyper edge you can prove that no assignment satisfies more than this fraction of constraints in the instance okay with like 99% probability now let's think a little bit more about what this expression is okay p was the predicate p inverse 1 is the set of all assignments that satisfy the predicate okay so notice that it's a k bit predicate so there are two to the k possible assignments so p inverse 1 is a subset of all possible k bit strings it's a subset of size at most 2 to the k this ratio in particular is the fraction of assignments out of all possible 2 to the k assignments that satisfy the predicate okay and so this is saying this val i upper bound is saying that you're basically you know very very close to uh, you know the fraction of assignment that satisfy the predicate p okay in particular if the predicate p is non trivial as in like it's not satisfied by every assignment in the world then you know this number is strictly less than 1 when you make epsilon tiny enough tiny enough but fixed constant okay good now some intuition for this value again because it's very very simple to prove this is simply the expected fraction of constraints that are satisfied in the csp instance when you choose a perfectly random assignment if you just choose x uniformly at random then this is the expected number of constraints to satisfy without the epsilon of course okay so what this bound is saying is that if you have you know more than n over epsilon square constraints then basically there is no assignment that beats Uh, the guarantees of the random assignment significantly okay so random assignment is basically even you know virtually the best possible assignment for this instance okay in particular as i said if epsilon is tiny enough and p is non trivial then this is a value strictly less than 1 which means that our refutation goal is reasonable like it's not a bogus goal to ask of an algorithm as long as i have you know at least these many constraints good very good so before going further one last bit of you know uh, uh, information that i want to import uh, i actually focused on the goal here where i just wanted to prove that the value is at most 1 right 
But now that we've discussed that the true value is around this P inverse one over two to the K number, I can actually, you know, make my goal a little bit stronger. I say, hey, you know what? Prove to me, not just that the value is less than one, but in fact, prove to me 99% of the times that the value is at most P inverse two to the K plus epsilon. It's a reasonable goal because it's a truth. In particular, a brute force algorithm could solve this, could actually meet this goal. So it's a legitimate thing to ask of our algorithm. Such a goal has a name. It's called strong refutation. Okay, and actually the goal I told you earlier is referred to as weak refutation when you want to distinguish it from the strong refutation. Okay, good. And so the key algorithmic question of concern to us after we have all this discussion uh, is done is that what's the smallest number of constraints required for an efficient refutation algorithm to exist. Notice that as M increases, in a certain sense, you know, the contradictions in the instance increase, so it should become easier and easier to prove that it is unsatisfiable. And in particular, a brute force algorithm succeeds as long as M is at least N over epsilon square. And you can ask, you know, what's the smallest M at which I can efficiently produce a certificate of unsatisfiability in, you know, formally speaking, what's the smallest M for which a polynomial time refutation algorithm exists? Okay, that's what our main concern is today. Good, and actually we'll focus mostly on strong refutation because that's what, you know, our algorithms will accomplish. Good. So, uh, you know, now that I have told you the problem, uh, I wanna, you know, tell you a little bit about, you know, the very long history of this problem. So it's gonna be extremely abridged and, you know, I would be extremely sparse in my references um, um, pardon me for it, but you know, I'll, I'll at least try to, you know, convince you uh, of uh, the different fields that the same problem occurs in and why people care about it. Okay. So most of the, ran most of the work actually uh, uh, in this direction has gone into studying the random model, the first model that I told you earlier. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, one reason it was studied early on, especially in the early nineties is in the context of proof complexity. So, you know, as you saw, this problem is actually at the heart of it is a problem about generating certificates or proofs of unsatisfiability. So it's no surprise that proof complexity theorists would be very interested in it. And that in fact is the reason they cared about it. And one, re one, one of the messages of this line of work is that, you know, if you look at, um, uh, you know, various restricted proof systems <clears throat> that proof complexity theorists study, then, you know, there are no short refutations, no efficient in various notions of efficiency, there are no efficient refutations for let's say, you know, random sat and other random CSPs when, you know, M is about order N. So when M is like N or epsilon square where a brute force algorithm exists, where there is a long certificate, you can ask, is there also a short and simple certificate in various senses of the world? And proof complexity theorists, you know, one message of this line of work is to show that, well, they don't exist. Okay, it's like in other words, this average case version of the problem is likely hard, at least in this restricted proof systems. Okay, that's that's basically a long line of work. I only have two early papers here, but you know, I think there are many, many, many papers that follow up on these uh, uh, on these papers. Good. So uh, at the same time, you know, uh, there was there were studies on algorithmic uh, uh, progress for this problem. You know, there were there were papers that were trying to design efficient algorithms for this problem, and. Uh, you know, one class of algorithms that are now known to uh, do very well, uh, at least they give us the best possible guarantees, um, are certain algorithms called as spectral algorithms. And I'll explain to you what this means uh, in just a little bit. Uh, but the main message, which, you know, I, I want you to take this number away with you right now, is that if we, let's say, focus on random 3SAT, where the predicate P is the 3SAT predicate, then you do know of an efficient refutation algorithm uh, when M exceeds n to the 1.5, okay? Now, one note or one, one point of caution for the whole talk, when I write this squiggly inequality, I'm gonna ignore polylog n factors, okay? And you'll see it's reasonable to do because you know we actually are root n, about a square root n larger than the information theoretic minimum limit that we saw using this churn plus union bound uh, you know, argument earlier. And so because you know we are root n larger, it's not a big deal to ignore polylog n factors. We are really interested in polynomial asymptotics because of this kind of bounds here. So the message is that you know you only know of an efficient algorithm for the refutation problem when your density exceeds the minimum possible density by a square root n additional factor up to some polylog n terms. Okay, and there is no known algorithm that works below this below uh, uh, you know n to the three halves 
In other words, you know, if you have n to the 49 constraints, there is no known efficient polynomial term algorithm that can generate refutations for random three set. Okay, good. So next piece in history, and actually, you know, so this algorithm, uh, I, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the reference, but I think it's uh, it appears in a paper of Koja Oglan, Gert, and Lanka, if I remember correctly. Um, but you know, after that, uh, and there was like a lot of work in the uh, you know uh, late '90s and early 2000s about finding better algorithms, and people realized that they can't quite come up with it. And um, uh, a big step was taken in this direction by Feige in 2001 in this really nice, really cool, really famous paper where he formulated a conjecture that actually this is not possible. <laughs> and uh, that conjecture is called the random three set hypothesis. <clears throat> actually, it's a, a, a you know cool sociological study on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how people name things, you know, like I always thought of hypothesis as weaker than conjectures. I wonder if hypothesis rise up to the stature of conjectures. But anyway, uh, Feige called, you know, this, this particular assumption, the ra random three set hypothesis. And basically just means that, you know, there is no polynomial time refutation algorithm in the sense that we just discussed, when M is, you know, some uh, theta N. So, you know, in other words, this conjecture is saying that, you know, if you want a polynomial time refutation algorithm, you'll need a density, which is uh, you know, asymptotically faster growing than n. Okay, that's it. So of course, this is a you know pretty conservative conjecture given our status of the algorithms, and uh, you know over time the stronger variants of these conjectures have been proposed. Um, uh, variants for other CSPs have been proposed. You know, other predicates, etc. And these have served as starting points for like a whole host of you know uh, hardness results that I will not mention. But you know, these applications arise in learning theory, statistics, game theory, and many, many other fields. Okay, so you can basically use this as a starting point for average case hardness results. Okay. Good. Um, and actually, you know, not to stress too much on these applications, but you know, one strong application arises in cryptography, where you know you can use this average case assumption to build what are called as local pseudo-random generators. Okay. Good. I don't want to go too much into detail, but just you know. Uh, uh, have the right buzzwords in. Uh, good. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, in terms of algorithmic progress, which is directly relevant for us, <clears throat> there is like a string of recent works in the last five years that try to address this problem at the complete generality for random CSPs, for the first random model. So there were these two algorithmic uh, works that basically, you know, gave new spectral algorithms that, you know, give uh, uh, very good guarantees, uh, generalize this n to the three halves guarantee for other CSPs, uh, you know, for every predicate in a certain sense. And it turns out that uh, in amongst a large class of algorithms, which are captured by this so-called sum of squares proof system, uh, you know, these works showed that these, act these algorithms are in fact, you know, optimal. So at least if you restrict to a certain a broad family of algorithms uh, called as sum of squares uh, uh, algorithms, then it turns out that we basically have a complete understanding of what happens to the refutation, uh, what happens in the refutation problem for random CSP model for every predicate. Okay, so again, I don't have that much time to discuss the specifics of this result, but this characterization is in terms of some simple property of the predicate. So you know, this you look at the predicate and you read off some property called as how uniform it is, and it completely decides, you know, um, what is the threshold for efficient refutation, uh, uh, etc if at least you care about only the sum of squares uh, algorithms, okay? But the message of these works, which I want to tell you is that if you believe in, you know, uh, uh, special algorithms, and if you think that, well, you know, at least we don't know of any other technique that can uh, do better for these problems, then we kind of completely understand the status for random CSPs. And we, you know, these results kind of serve as um, evidence for the starting points of reduction that I told you earlier. Good, that's the story of random CSPs. The, story of semi-random CSPs is less well-developed, okay? So this model, the model that I defined earlier um, was proposed uh, by Feige, um, uh, you know, uh, about 15 years ago. Um, and actually, you know, in some sense, Feige was motivated by uh, several works that study semi-random versions of the coloring CSP, uh, the coloring problem, and say, okay, you know, we should, we should consider this problem for 3SAT, et cetera. And um, uh, uh, even, even in the semi-random setting. So here, the random CSPs were already well studied, but he generalized the setting to semi-random ones. And the main motivations, you know, as you might imagine is when you're designing algorithms, maybe you want to care about what properties of the random instance are really relevant to your algorithm to succeed. In other words, you would want your algorithms to be somewhat robust 
and you know to to use as few properties of a random instance as possible right in a certain sense if you want to understand the complexity of the problem that's what you should do and you know maybe you're concerned about how brittle your algorithm is you know you how reliant on the assumption about the structure of the random model is it so that was like the intrinsic motivation that pige i guess had when he formalized this model but since then you know the question about extending algorithm for random csps to semi random settings has been asked by a number of different uh, uh, works uh, <clears throat> and it actually occurs uh, specifically in the context of certain pseudo random generators that uh, cryptographers have proposed in order to build this uh, cool gadget called as indistinguishability obfuscation again not our interest but basically there are actual motivations for studying the semi random model that arise in cryptography good that's all i want to uh, you know tell you about uh, this abridged history of csp refutation of both random and the semi random models so now you know i can tell you the main result of this work which is you know this informal statement that basically you can match the guarantees for every csp uh, that you obtain for the random case you can match them also in the semi random case so in other words the algorithms that were using if like the algorithm that were so far using um you know the randomness in the hypergraph h well now you can actually design new algorithms that match the exact same guarantees uh, you know uh, even when the graph h is completely arbitrary okay and again when i say same i think we lose some extra polylog factors which we don't know how to cure so you know uh, uh, it's 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 not same if you care about polylog n factors but you know if you care only about asymptotic growth in n then you know we we actually match the random case and you know in other words you know if you think the random the case for the algorithms for the random case are optimal then this is saying that well you know <laughs> we've gotten the right algorithms for the semi random case too uh, if not you know you better improve the at least the random case before trying to improve the semi random case um, so you know the other way to interpret this is saying that you know the semi random case somewhat surprisingly is no harder than the random case okay so let me pause and see if there are any questions so far because uh, Uh, i have dumped a lot of information on you <clears throat> okay good so let me continue <clears throat> so i now want to tell you you know a little bit about what techniques go into solving this refutation problem and hopefully i'll get to tell you at least at a high level you know what are the new ideas at least some of the new ideas in this work okay and the first idea that i want to leave you with it if you haven't seen this before uh, i'm, I'm very... sorry pravesh yes. can i can i interrupt just with a question from the beginning actually so of course uh, your predicates are are you assu assuming in this world that they are symmetric somehow it, it was suggested by this hypergraph viewpoint so do they need to be uh, symmetric or good or no so the hypergraph language was loose you're absolutely right yeah, okay, i do okay. want to think of them as ordered k tuples so mm, you know i right. really have a collection of ordered k tuples so my predicates are not necessarily symmetric okay thanks thanks so it's more general than i thought yes yes thanks perfect yes good uh okay so let's continue So you know, as I told you, like my goal is uh, to really. So most of the talk is really about ideas that will be considered old, but I, I actually don't know how uh, well known these ideas are, and they're really cool. So I want to you know uh, leave you with some of these things, which you might enjoy uh, even more than our present work. <laughs> so um, so the first trick I want to tell you about is that it turns out that if you don't care about constants, if you don't care about you know losing constants in the threshold for the number of constraints m. then you can essentially focus attention on solving the problem for kxor okay so kxor if you don't know i'll soon define it but it's a very specific uh, predicate which takes the value 1 uh, only when the parity of the bits is you know uh, even and you know if the parity of the bits is odd it takes the value minus 1 or 0 okay so uh, uh, and and this is like some classical trick which fige uh, in his 2001 work already uh, discovered actually it might have been known even before that to be honest um <clears throat> and you know for applying it to other csps this trick was generalized by this work of allen o'donnell and whitmer but the message is that somehow it turns out that there is a completely black box reduction that works both in the random case and the semi random case that tells you that if you can solve the refutation problem for kxor at the right density at the right m then you can solve it for all csps at the right m for those csps okay so 
again, I will not tell you what this trick is because I want to tell you more interesting ideas. But this is good idea to uh, you know good. This is good to remember that somehow you know this reputation problem that can look unsurmountable at first, right? Because it seems like you know how do I handle every predicate in the world? But it turns out that you can completely reduce it to just handling XOR. And so you know uh, suddenly it seems way more uh, tractable because there are only a few predicates to deal with. Good. So given that. I can tell you the main quantitative result. You know, the new thing that we really are doing is really for KXR, and then we're just plugging in this five gaze XR trick to get the result for all CSPs, okay? So in particular, we are proving that there is an algorithm that succeeds in solving the semi-random refutation problem for KXR, okay? Whenever M is at least N to the K over two, okay? So if you remember 3SAT that I gave you this example 3SAT earlier, turns out that you can reduce 3SAT essentially to 3XOR. And so you remember this n to the 3 halves bound that I told you, well, that's an instance of this n to the k over 2 bound. Now that result, when I was telling you about, it was about the random case. And this one is about the semi-random case, but the bound is exactly the same up to polylog n factors for the fully random case. Okay, so the main result is really proving this result, proving this bound for XOR in the semi-random setting for every k. Okay, so I'll I'll refine this 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 uh, this 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 observation a little bit more <clears throat> by pointing out this weird distinction that a priori might appear some insane technicality, but it turns out that it's a real issue, and I'll explain. This is the real issue that we have to tackle now: is the difference between even arity XOR and odd arity XOR. So like three XOR and four XOR. <laughs> okay. So it turns out that, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly why, but the case of even KXR is easy. <clears throat> turns out that you know there is some simple tricks you can do and handle even K, but those simple tricks do not work for odd K. And so, so it turns out that our main result is really, you know, I can, I can refine it even further. The real true new result is really for the semi-random refutation for odd KXR because the even one is like really simple and already known, okay? That's all we are doing in this work. We are only solving the case of odd arity KXR in the case of semi-random refutation, okay? Good. So again, I'm gonna come to the details in a second, but you know, um, uh, just to justify why this is going on. So even in the case of fully random CSP refutation, the even arity KXR case was done way earlier. The case of odd arity XOR, in particular 3XOR, took a long time. And in fact, it was finished only, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, uh, at the right level of generality, it was finished only, uh, you know, um, uh, about five years ago in this very nice work of Barak and Moitra, who used, you know, some heavy random matrix theory tools called as a trace moment method um, uh, to actually, you know, establish this n to the 3 half threshold for 3XOR and n to the k half threshold for odd KXOR. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and now, you know, I already told you this n to the three half bound was kind of known for random CSPs earlier. It turns out that those bounds were really establishing weak refutation. And even that required a lot of work. Even weak refutation required a lot of work, uh, you know, even in the fully random setting. It turns out that, you know, you need some um, extremal combinatorics results about the existence of certain uh, combinatorial objects called as even covers to make that happen. Okay. The only point of these two uh, uh, claims is that you know it was kind of non-trivial even in the fully random case to somehow you know understand this odd arity refutation, okay? And so as I tell you, our main idea is to you know um, um, is to is to use you know a combination of uh, three different techniques, um, and I'll explain these techniques to you in a second. These are going to be spectral methods. I'll tell you what those are. I'm gonna tell you about a semi-definite programming based reputation algorithm. I'll tell you what that is. And I'm gonna combine these two methods with a combinatorial decomposition theorem, which also I will try to tell you, okay? And so, um, um, you know, in, 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 you know one, one very nice takeaway, which, you know, if I don't get to it, then, you know, I really recommend just checking out the overview section of our paper, which is like, you know, page and a half long, is a extremely simple proof for the fully random case that we can now give for this n to the three halves bound. So and as I told you, you know, this case of odd arity XOR refutation, uh, you know, even in the fully random case was kind of non-trivial and required a really technical proof. 
But one of the key nice points that comes out in this work of ours is that you know uh, the new technique gives a really simple proof, you know, for the fully random case. In fact, you know that's really important because we kind of use that as a starting point. If we didn't have a really simple proof, then we won't have been able to extend it to the semi-random case. And so the key idea is somehow to find a really simple, uh, you know, uh, refutation algorithm for the fully random odd parity XOR refutation. Okay, and so. Um, my ambitious plan was to explain this proof completely, but given the way time is progressing, I feel like I'll not get to it. Therefore, I you know, uh, strongly recommend just checking out the page and a half overview section in the paper, okay? Should be really completely readable without any other context, especially with the notation I've set right now. <laughs> and it should be really quick. Good. So let me now explain you know, these three pieces that I told you about. The spectral refutation, semi-deferred programming-based refutation, and this combinatorial decomposition, okay? So I need some extra notation, unfortunately, but it's going to be simple, okay? So let's say that I'm going to represent the k-tuples that appear in my CSP instance as C1 up to Cm, okay? Then, um, just to clarify this odd, uh, the XOR predicate that we've been talking about, it basically corresponds to the function Px, which computes just the product of the bits, okay? In, uh, in 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 the in the in the um, uh, in 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 the k tuple that defines the constraint. So just like take the product of the bits in the constraint. Okay. And the point is that in the plus minus one world, the product computes the parity of the bits, right? Because you 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 know the product basically computes how many times minus one appears, which is equal to the parity, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, of of uh, of the bits. And so you know the XOR has a really simple representation. It's simply a monomial in this plus minus one world. Okay, good. So now what about a negation pattern? So now remember we had this negation pattern where we were uh, applying negations to every possible bit. Now because my predicate is simply a monomial, I get to multiply all these negation patterns together and just extract a single bit out because that's all you know the negation pattern is doing now. And so which means that I can represent negation patterns by a single bit instead of like this K bits that I had to do for general CSPs, general predicates, okay? So now my negation pattern is going to be a, just a single bit bi, one for each constraint. And remember, it's gonna be chosen uniformly at random and independently for every constraint in both the models I'm caring about today, okay? Given this, I can now describe this function i of x in the context specialized to XOR, which is simply you know, the sum of bi multiplied by xci. Xci notice is you know, just a monomial on the k tuple of variable that appears in C sub i. So I'm basically taking the parity of the bits, the plus minus one parity of the bits in C sub i. I'm multiplying it by the negation pattern that applies to it, okay? And I'm averaging over all possible constraints, okay? Now, why is this i of x relevant? Well, notice that if x, a certain assignment x satisfies all the constraints, then bi dot xci would be one. In other words, xci, the product xci would take the value b sub i. That's what it means for the constraint to be satisfied, okay? And so if x satisfies all the constraints, each of these bi dot xci's would be one, which means that this average would be one, okay? Stop, stop me if this is unclear, okay? Stop me if anything is unclear. In particular, this is unclear. Okay, very good. And so, so, so basically this, 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 this particular you know, polynomial expression, which characterizes the instance is something that I only, is, is the only thing now I have to deal with. In particular, as I observed, if the instance is satisfiable, then the value of i of x is one. And in, part, and, and in general, if, you know, uh, if every assignment gives i of x a value of at most some number epsilon, then you know, you can prove that val i is exactly, uh, you know, half plus epsilon by two. So, you know, this is just some translation. This is just some shifting by half and translation of the value that we saw earlier, okay? And in particular, if you look at like a random assignment, then, you know, the expected value of i is zero and the val had expected value half. So this, this shift by half occurs, okay? The thing to observe though, and the thing to take away is that if I want to refute XOR, if I want to, you know, certify an upper bound on the value of a KXOR CSP, all I have to prove is that the max of i of x is strictly less than one. And actually, you know, for strong reputation that it's, you know, less than some tiny enough epsilon. Okay, so let's maybe record that as a goal here. 
My goal is to take some instance of XOR now, and my algorithm should output a value V. V should be an upper bound on max of I of X over all assignments, which I'm calling bias of I. And V should be at most epsilon 99% of the times when the instance is random, okay? So now let's recall what the semi-random, like what is the randomness in the semi-random case? C sub i's are fixed, right? Because my hypergraph is completely arbitrary. I have no control over it. It's not chosen at random. So the only probability in the semi-random case comes from choosing the negation patterns at random, which in the case of XOR is simply a single bit for every constraint. So it's like, you know, B is chosen uniformly at random from plus minus one to the M. And you know, that describes the instance on the hypergraph H and I want my algorithm to output something at most epsilon 99% of the times. Okay, again, I know a lot of notation. So let me pause for 10 seconds or 30 seconds and see if there are any questions, if I can clarify anything for you. Okay, good. So now I wanna tell you these two tools that I was talking about, okay? Let me tell you how, you know, uh, how spectral refutation even plays a role here. How can I use eigenvalues of certain matrices to come up with upper bounds on, or come up with like, you know, refutation algorithms like this, okay? So let's try to understand this trick when K is two, two XR, okay? Really, really simple. So we're looking at two XR, okay? Now, in the case of two XR, the idea is the following. Let's look at I of X. How does it look? Well, it looks at, you know, I'm just like looking at this expression we defined on the previous slide, right? Now, somehow things have gotten erased. So now, you know, um, the idea is that this is like some, you know, XCI is a monomial of degree two, right? It's a product of two bits because I have a two XR instance, right? So I'm going to somehow try to write this expression as a quadratic form of a certain matrix. Okay, what matrix is it? Well, define the matrix A, which at R comma S, so it's, you know, think of the matrix A as indexed by the variables of the CSP instance, okay? Now, a, a, a entry of the matrix identifies a pair of variables, okay? ARS at a pair of variables would be equal to some scaling of, you know, the, 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 the negation pattern at constraint R comma S, if it does appear in your instance. So, you know, like look at the pair RS, either it appears in a constraint or it doesn't appear in a constraint. If it doesn't appear in a constraint, just set ARS to be zero, okay? If it does appear in the constraint, then, you know, the monomial XR XS is gonna be, you know, multiplied by B sub I in this expression. So just add B sub I over two, you know, for that pair. And this two is just to adjust for the fact that, you know, R comma S appears twice. It's like as R S and as S comma R, okay? So now the observation is that I can take this expression, which is a degree two polynomial, you know, when I view it as a function of X and I can write it as a quadratic form of this matrix A. Like I literally wrote down, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, this B sub I is just A R S, uh, uh, you know, uh, A R S plus A S R gives me B sub I and both of them multiply X sub R, X R, X S. So I literally get the same expression here. Okay, good. And the point is that this, this expression that you're looking at here is simply the quadratic form, a scaled quadratic form of the matrix A on the assignment X. Okay, good. So now what? Well, remember bias I was simply the max of I of X over all possible X's, right? Which means that I can upper bound I of X in the following way. I can observe that for every X, not just assignments plus minus one, but literally every vector X in the world, bias I is at most one over M. Now I'm going to upper bound X transpose AX by the norm L2 squared norm of X times the largest eigenvalue or largest singular value of the matrix A. Okay, this is a bound. Notice that, you know, I have, I have I, this is a lossy inequality because this maximum is true not just for plus minus one valued vectors X, it's true for all possible vectors X, okay? But nevertheless, it's a valid upper bound. It may not be a great bound in general, but it's a valid upper bound, okay? Which means that I can use the following simple refutation algorithm. Given an instance of two XOR, compute this matrix A, okay? 
and just compute its largest eigenvalue. Notice that L2 square norm of X is N because you know each entry is plus minus one. So when you square and add, you get N. So I literally get the value N over M, the largest eigenvalue of A, okay? Notice that without doing anything, I have a correct algorithm, right? Because the value is always, the value V that I'm outputting is always an upper bound on val i, okay? So the only question is how good is it? We'll come to it in a second, okay? But this is algorithm number one. This is what I'm gonna call spectral refutation, okay? Before going further, I wanna explain to you a second kind of refutation. I'm gonna call it SDP refutation, okay? Here's what it means. Remember our instance? the same quadratic form. Let's just focus on 2XR still, okay? Then instead of upper bounding I of X in terms of the eigenvalues of A, this time I'm going to be slightly clever and try to use the fact that my vectors X have to have only plus or minus one coordinates. So I'm gonna take a simple SDP relaxation of max 2XR. If you've not seen this before, it doesn't matter. Just trust me that there is a natural SDP relaxation. And you know, this is how it looks like. It just, you know, maximizes the trace of a dot x, that x is, you know, the SDP, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, variable, the solution matrix. And I have the constraint that x is positive semi-definite and that the diagonals of x are one. In particular, the diagonals of x being one are the constraints that use the fact that the, the coordinates of x were plus or minus one, okay? Like the one way to think about the SDP is, you know, it, it's, um, this is equal, to one over M trace of A dot X, X transpose where X is an assignment. And so, you know, what we are doing here is just relaxing the rank one matrix X, X transpose, which has diagonals one, by the way, to any arbitrary PSD matrix X with diagonals one, okay? Anyway, so if you've not seen this before, it doesn't matter, but this is a very simple SDP relaxation. And because it's a relaxation, it's again, always an upper bound, no matter what the instance, okay? And it turns out that you can analyze this uh, uh, SDP quite nicely using this cool tool called as the growth and deak inequality, okay? Again, you don't need to know what it is, just the fact that growth index inequality in our case tells you, so, you know, we just proved that SDP i is a relaxation, which means that it's an upper bound on the true value, the true bias i, right? But it turns out that it's actually not a bad upper bound. It turns out that SDP i is at most some k, where k goes as log n, times the maximum value of ix. So in other words, this bound is tight, okay, within some log n factors to the truth, okay? So now, how do I use this for refutation? Well, you know, I just use the Chernoff plus union bound argument for the random 2xr or semi-random 2xr to bound the true value. And then I know that the SDP is gonna give me a value which is at most log n worse. And I can use, you know, either of these tools to actually get refutation that works, you know, whenever I have M bigger than or equal to N log N for two XOR. Both these tools are enough to do random or semi-random two XOR. Both these tools are enough to do that. Okay. I'm, again, I'm gonna pause for like 30 seconds to make sure that I didn't lose any of you here. So I told you how to do two XOR completely now and I told you two different tools for it. Okay, good. So what about larger K? Okay, let's look at why the even K case is easy, right? I told you earlier that even K case requires no work. Let's see why, okay? So here is the one line idea. The idea is that I have, you know, K variables. If K is even, I'm simply going to think of the KXR, the monomial of K bits as actually a monomial, a, a monomial of, uh, you know, degree two in a higher, like, uh, you know, in an enlarged space. So I'm just gonna like create n to the k over two variables for all possible k over two tuples of variables and think of kxr as two xr in this enlarged space, okay? And if it, if, if it makes sense to you, here is the notation, here is, in, here is what's happening in notation. I've created variables y for all possible k tuples, k over two tuples, okay? And I write an arbitrary even identity XOR constraint as just a two XOR constraint in this enlarged variable space. And notice that what I told you earlier immediately gives us n to the k over two, right? Because our algorithm previously for two XOR worked when m was bigger than n log n, the n has changed to n to the k over two here, okay? And I told you that 
the two XOR thing works for both random and semi-random case. So I have completely told you how to do even arity XOR refutation for both cases. That's it, done. Okay. All we have to do now is the odd arity case, which is of course the main, <laughs> main result of the paper. Okay. So let me explain to you what the idea for odd arity refutation is. Okay. And I'm actually maybe at most 10 minutes away from the end of my talk. So let's let's try and see, and then you know I'll back for some time, uh, you know, from uh, um, uh, from Andre and uh, Jakub when I get to the end. <laughs> um, so let me explain to you, you know, how would you want to do this odd arity XOR? And you see, like you know, there's a very basic problem here. It's like you know, this if you try to do this uh, enlarged space business that we did for even ITK, you would have to use n square variables, right? Because you like one natural way to do it is just make variables for every pair and every singleton, right? Now in this enlarged space, you have n square variables, which means that you will succeed in doing odd arity, let's say three XOR, uh, you know, for constraint, well, for M, which is larger than N square, but the right bound you want is N to the three halves. So you are off by root N, right? This is all that we are, this pesky root N is all that we are removing in this work. Okay, that's all we are trying to do. They're trying to be cleverer than you know this simple enlarging trick. Okay, so let me tell you how people did it. Barak and Moisra in particular did it for fully random case. Okay, because it's a pretty instructive idea too. Okay, so here's the idea. They look at i x as you know. So here is a degree three polynomial that corresponds to the i x for three x or. Okay. Now what they do is they look at all constraints that contain let's say some fixed variable i, okay? So they look, they sum over all i and look at all constraints that touch variable i, okay? They pull out xi from this monomial and write the remaining thing, which is the degree two polynomial as a quadratic form of some matrix, let's say b sub i, just like we did earlier, right? Whenever you have a degree two polynomial, it's a two xor instance, and I can write it as a quadratic form just like we did earlier, okay? Good, so now I can write i x as some xi times x transpose bix, where bi is this, you know, two xor instance of all the constraints that touch i. Okay, so far so good. Very good, okay. So now here is the trick, okay? Here is the main trick. The main trick is to look at this expression and apply the cauchy schwarz inequality. <laughs> okay, so I have, I have a sum over product of two terms so I'm going to like decouple them using cauchy schwarz inequality. Okay, here is what happens. Um, you know, instead of writing square roots, I squared both sides so that I don't have to take square roots. And now I of x is at most, here is the first term. Okay, and here is the second term. Oh no. There I am, okay. Okay. Now, what's the, what's the greatness about this? Well, look at the first thing, you know, I have X i square is one for every I. So this becomes a constant. Okay. And the second thing I get to square X transpose B i X. Okay. Now, you know, it becomes a degree four polynomial, which I can treat as a four X or instance. Okay. So now, you know, in some sense, I have reduced my task, perhaps in a lossy way, but I have nevertheless reduced it to bounding or computing an upper bound for this four XOR instance. Still good, still following me? <laughs> okay, good. So now here is, you know, okay. So ignore, ignore all this computation. I was a bit too ambitious there. Um, the idea is that you can take this X transpose B I X squared and write it as a quadratic form in the enlarged space of n square variables as a two XOR, just like the trick I told you earlier for even IIT XOR, okay? And it turns out that if you take the matrix, the quadratic form that defines this two XOR instance, you can write it nicely as a tensor product of this matrix BI with itself. Trust me on this because, you know, we are running out of time. So I have to ask you to trust me on this. This is some simple manipulation, okay? This is simply writing the four XOR instance as a two XOR instance in the enlarged space there Y are, you know, uh, y is a variable in this enlarged n square variable space. I'm writing it as a quadratic form. Okay. And now what? Well, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, okay. So I guess I didn't do this whole step here, but you know, basically now I can write it as one over I, B I tensor B I, Y transpose Y. So, you know, I have written down the, 
I have written down an upper bound of the value of this instance in terms of this matrix here. Okay. So just like we did earlier in the spectral refutation case, if I come up with a good upper bound on the largest eigenvalue of this particular matrix here, I'll be done. Okay. Still good. Still nice. Okay. So Barak and Moitra actually do this in the completely random case. But notice that you know you're getting a little bit. Yeah, the things are getting a bit complicated here in terms of analyzing the largest eigenvalue of this matrix here. Okay, in the fully random case, they succeed, and they use this uh, you know workhorse of random matrix theory called the trace moment method to actually accomplish this. Okay, it turns out that if you actually try to compute this bound in the semi-random case, it not only doesn't work; it's actually false. There is no good upper bound in general in the semi-random case on this particular matrix, so you can't quite succeed using spectral refutation. Okay, so spectral refutation fails. Okay, you can say, okay, we have this other tool, the SDP refutation. What about that? Why can't we use that? It turns out, if you remember correctly, we have this analysis using growth index inequality, where if we upper bounded the true value of the instance, then you know uh, the growth index inequality tells us that you know the 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 SDP value is not too far. Okay, this seems almost you know almost there. We seem to be almost there. But we are not. We are. We are actually very far because we are trying to upper bound the value of a four XOR instance. We are in this enlarged space now. Okay. Like earlier, we were doing it for two XOR. Now we are doing it for four XOR produced from a three XOR. Okay. So the key point is that the four XOR instance in this enlarged space has n square variables, right? So if you wanted to do union bound and Chernoff bound like argument to upper bound the true value of the four XOR instance produced. You would need at least n square bits of randomness, but you started from a three XOR instance, and you are trying to do the case where you know there are only n to the one point five constraints, so you have way fewer bits of randomness. So you are now in trouble, right? Like you are the only like in some sense you have to come up with a way to analyze the true value of this instance, which beats the union bound by a whole lot. Okay, so hopefully you know you get some idea for why both spectral refutation and SDP refutation are in trouble if you try to apply in a semi-random case. Okay, so uh, Yakub, I only have like one slide to explain uh, you know at a high level how we are going to overcome this. Is that okay, or should I stop? Um, well, I don't know. I guess you can have two minutes, but uh, that's that's okay. about it. Okay. Yeah, I'll take only two minutes. Okay. So let me ignore this. Let me, you know, give you pointers instead. Okay, I had some more math, but I'll stop there. So the first thing we do, as I promised you, is give a completely new proof of this eigenvalue upper bound on bi tensor bi, the sum over i, this matrix that you know came up in uh, Barak Moitra analysis, and we actually, you know, do it using a off-the-shelf matrix concentration inequality without running the trace moment method, and you know, uh, on a good day I would tell you how this works because it is very simple, but today I will not. <laughs> okay. And then what we do, what we do is like we go and try to open up the proof of why this whole analysis works, and we do what we set out to do, which is we identify a deterministic condition on the graph H, which makes this analysis work. So you know now we are doing what we were you know really intending to do. We were trying to analyze which conditions make the random like the like the the analysis of the random case work. We actually extract the deterministic condition out that makes the simple algorithm work. Okay. Then what do we do? Well, there is only one natural thing to do, right? You this, you know, this condition somehow was the key idea behind the randomness, the random, uh, the fully random case. So you, you know, identify that as some kind of a pseudo randomness condition. And then what we do is we take arbitrary instance and we show that we can decompose it into a pseudo random instance and a structured instance. We can somehow use, you know, some variant of spectral refutation for the pseudo random instance. It turns out that the, the vanilla one doesn't work, but it requires you know some additional ideas. And for the structured instance, we show that because of the way its structure is, we can actually make semi-definite refutation work. And so you know, in some sense, if you combine this combinatorial decomposition, which can be done efficiently, along with these two tools that we study, then we are done. And so that's all I want to tell you. Sorry for going on a little bit uh, in time, uh, and sorry for not telling you the complete proof. <laughs> that's okay. That's uh, that's thank Pravesh. Um, I believe there is a question for you in in the chat. Ah, okay. Let me take a look. Um, 
somehow. Oh, there it is. Okay. Ah, uh, yes, I guess uh, it seems like Anisha's question is already answered. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, any more questions for Pravesh, please? Libor? Yeah, so uh, just very roughly, like what, what kind of algorithms are used for this decomposition you need? I mean, what, what is it about? Is it some matrix things or something completely different? Ah, good, good. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually a very combinatorial thing. It, so, so it turns out, so I mean, I, I'll just tell you the punchline, even though like the proof itself is not that hard, okay? So here's the punchline. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, let degree i t be, you know, uh, the number of constraints in your instance that contain, you know, uh, variables i and v. So it's a 3xor, uh, you know, system. Think of all the constraints that contain two of the variables i and b. Okay. In general, they can be multiple. Okay. So it turns out that the random case, the analysis for the random case works as long as the following mysterious combinatorial condition holds. So for all pairs of variables v and v prime if the sum of the product of their degrees at i happens to be at most order log n, then you actually work, okay? And this is actually very easily satisfied in the random case because, you know, um, the only, you know, if, if you take like less than n square constraints, then the number of constraints that use a pair of variables is basically order one, okay? And so that's it. This is our combinatorial condition. This is our pseudo random condition. Like, you know, whenever this condition holds, the random analysis goes through. This is like key observation. And somehow, you know, what we can do is uh, we break the instance into parts and the pseudo random part satisfies that degree IV is always small for every variable. And then we collect the structured instance where this is not true and show that something else uh, holds there that makes the SDP reputation go through. Okay. Sorry about not being able to give uh, sufficient details here, but that's, it's a very simple property, like nothing very complicated going on. It's a very simple combinatorial property. Thank you. Uh, you were very happy. Yes, looks like it. Uh, any more questions, please? Well, I, I might ask a very simple question. Eh? So uh, uh, you started with uh, uh, the random case when everything is random. So then you removed some randomness. So what, what, what is this uh, randomless uh, landscape? So what, what is it that you, you, you have to keep and uh, what is it that you can remove? Uh, uh, as so in, how, how less random can you make it? Good. You're saying how can we go beyond semi-random in some sense? Is that the question? Is that the maybe, right? maybe not, not beyond, but maybe a different truth. Some, something less random. Uh, right. So in a certain sense, I think the, the semi-random model that I discussed is uh, probably the least random model I expect where you can actually succeed here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, perhaps there is a way to choose the literal patterns in some mildly correlated way and make this analysis still go through. So you might be able to decrease the randomness by, you know, maybe dropping the strict condition that the literal patterns for every k-tuple needs to be independent. You might be able to relax that a little bit. But uh, yeah, to be honest, I don't see natural models that go beyond that uh, uh, too much. So in a certain sense, yeah, it seems like we are already at uh, roughly the minimal level of uh, randomness that at least our algorithmic ideas need. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. If I may, I might have uh, another question uh, yes. relevant to this one. So you're dealing with Boolean CSPs, right? Yes. So do you have some intuition what the right definition of semi-random in like three element case would be? Like if the domain has three elements? Ah, good, yes. <clears throat> uh, I think so, yeah. So. Uh, 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 I think uh, the k-tuples uh, are still going to be arbitrary. That's a natural thing to do it, right? And so now the yeah. question is, uh, what's the literal pattern, right? And maybe one way to do it is, you know, you pick uh, uh, an element of F3 to the k at random and, you know, shift the constraints uh, additively with this. Uh, uh, with this. So, so does that make sense? You know, um, instead of, so then now it's easier to write it in, uh, you know, the, the, the additive world. So imagine that, you know, your assignment now lives in F3 to the N. 
okay the the field of three uh, the field of three elements you know uh, the yeah the and, and now you know you choose for every constraint b which is like uh, f3 to the k and now the kth constraint basically corresponds to taking x1 up to xk the k tuple that appears plus vector b and say that this is equal to 1 does it mm -hmm. seem reasonable so it's yeah. like you know i'm applying a random shift to every variable so instead of yeah. the random flips i'm applying a random shift and you think this will be enough because like you can actually get it more random by just taking you know any permutation of the three values not just the shift yeah that's true so at least you know uh, the in the fully random case where we actually do uh, know how to do uh, even the um, even the higher alphabet csps this shift mm -hmm. notion actually is enough in the fully random okay. case so my guess is that it might be enough even here but yeah i i might be wrong because we have not tried to do the higher alphabet case at all here Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a that's a that's a cool open question. Uh, I guess to work out. Yeah, I think since it gets the expectation right, this should be enough. I think since all you use is first moment type things and independence. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, any more questions for Prayesh? Um, uh, yeah, there's a a question in the chat. So, uh, um, the question is this: So you use only one predicate. Uh, good. What good. if you are, yeah. if you have more than one? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question, and I think um, um, again, even though this has explicitly not been studied, even in the fully random case, I think existing techniques might be enough to like with some with some minor modifications, you might be able to get uh, a right answer for any set of templates. Like you know, if you take a collection of predicates. Then it, you know, there's. Like, I, I told you this this property earlier, which completely governs the behavior of random CSPs. Which, you know, let me just refer to it vaguely as the degree of uniformity. And it seems to me that you know the the behavior for refutation, at least for weak refutation, would be completely governed by you know the 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 easiest predicate for refutation in your template. So in some sense, you know, it would be some simple max slash min of this property in the template of your predicates. Now, if I have to generalize, that would also be my guess for the semi-random case, even though, you know, both these things have not been tried or written down yet. But my guess is that, you know, there is some simple uh, max slash min of the property, uh, you know, in the set of predicates that you have that will govern the behavior. Does, it, does that make sense? Um, Michael, does it make, oh, I guess, uh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's curious. So, uh, it, uh, so what you say is that they actually it's somehow linearly, linearly ordered by how how good or bad they are, right? Very actually, good. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I um, okay. I'm kind of tempted to tell you what this is because it's very simple. Okay. Um, here is here is the cool property of. Uh, so let me. Yeah, I'll take it maybe at most two minutes. Okay, just because I've referred okay, to this fine. property twice. So let's look at three XOR, right? Like we talked about this predicate, and what's the property? Uh, so let me tell you what property it has. Okay. It has the following property. There is a distribution on, you know, the sat like uh, the space of assignments of three XOR, which is, you know, supported only on satisfying assignments of three XOR. Okay, and is pairwise independent, pairwise uniform. So the first two marginals of this distribution are uniform. And what is a distribution? It is simply the uniform distribution on all the assignments. You can check very easily that you know it is pairwise uniform. This is the key property that governs you know whether you will need n to the three halves uh, constraints or you know some constant times n would be enough. And there's a generalization of this property, the property of being able to support a pairwise uniform distribution, namely the ability to support pairwise or t-wise uniform distribution that governs you know these higher refutation thresholds. So you know it's it's a very simple property, and what I'm saying is that if you have a set of predicates, okay, and if any of them, if none of, if, if there is at least one of them which is not pairwise uniform, meaning there is no distribution on the set of satisfying assignments of the predicate which is pairwise uniform, then you would be able to refute at least weakly refute the whole CSP, uh, you know, in about n log n constraints. If on the other hand all the predicates are let's say pairwise uniform, meaning for all the predicates there is some distribution. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, which which is supported entirely on the satisfying assignments of that predicate and is pairwise uniform, then you would need n to the three halves or larger number of constraints. Okay. 
that is my guess uh, you know given what i understand about the fully random uh, case right now does it does it make some sense yeah okay yeah thanks i mean it, it it's obviously hard to give intuition for why this property matters but uh, it turns out it does um okay well thanks a lot pravesh so let's let's uh, pravesh uh, again for a great talk um uh, and uh, that's that's it uh the next talk will be in early um December given by Alex Brandt and you will be notified as usual. Okay, thanks Andre and Jakub. Thanks all thanks. for joining. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Thank you.